Good morning, Eastside family. It is good to be able to worship together this Sunday morning. Um, it's the residents from 264 Ash coming to you recorded from 264 Ash. Um, it is good that we can still worship um, collectively and together, even though we're separated. Remember that as we worship, even if it's just you and your TV or your family in your basement or in your living room, know that we are gathering together as the body of Christ this morning, um, scattered throughout to this area, and we can still worship the same God together. So maybe you need to turn your TV up a little louder so you don't feel so awkward, um, but let's truly worship this morning, just as if we were gathered at Skyline. mentioned this song is one to introduce again to Eastside and it's been on my heart since I took some college students down to Passion in Atlanta and so this is I think we've done it before but it might be a little bit new to some of you um, but it is truly beautiful as we think about being in Lent and the preparation for the coming of Jesus and yeah him being worthy of his name. Holiness with human hands 
As I think of your name, Emmanuel, God with us, um, I'm so grateful. We are in uncertain times, um, and it is so good to know, Lord, that you are with us, um, that you don't leave us in these times, God, but you hold us close and that we can run to you and rest in your embrace, uh, trusting that you're with us. God, we are grateful, and you are worthy of your name. Uh, we worship you and we praise you, God. Hey, Eastside. This is Pastor Matt. I'm coming to you from the, the Tice's deck. This might actually be the, the prettiest backdrop I've ever had when given a message. There's a couple things that I want you to know. First, I am wearing pants 
Uh, last week when I watched the video of Pastor Peter in his blazer and his shirt, I kept thinking, I bet he doesn't have pants on. And so I want you to rest assured that I have pants on. We're going to start a sermon series, a short sermon series about money. And as we have been thinking about uh, all these different changes that have happened in all of our lives over the past few days, I wondered if that's really the thing that we should be talking about. Um, but as I, as I continued studying, as I continued thinking about what I want to say, I, I hope to talk about it in a way that uh, is relevant for what we're all going through right now. There's a couple things. First, we tend to talk about money in churches when uh, a church isn't making its budget. And I want you to know, first of all, that it's only March and we have no idea if we're going to make the budget. So that's not the reason. Second, uh, we often talk about money when churches aren't generous. And we've just gone through uh, a, a vision campaign as a church family. And you all have been incredibly generous. And we have, we've got pledges for far more than we expected or imagined. So that's not the reason that we're talking about money. I'm part of a, our di church is part of a district. There goes my notes. Thanks, Ryan. Our church is part of a district of churches, and that district ta has a budget together. And as we've talked together about our district budget, we compared individual congregations' budgets with their number of members. And we literally sat around the table, and other people around the table said to me, Matt, what's happening at Eastside? You all have to know that you're incredibly generous, and that's not the reason that we're, not ta that we're talking about money, because we're not doing well. We are. We're talking about money because there are certain things that tend to get a grip on our lives, whether it's money, sex, and power, the three things that we've always talked about as a culture. But if we can allow those things, or if we can lessen the grip of those things in our life, it re allows our reflection of Christ and our witness as a church to be that much stronger. And so that's why we want to continue to talk about money, because it's a discipleship issue. So. Here we go. We're going to talk about 1 Timothy chapter 6. So if you have your Bibles, would you please turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6. We're going to be looking at verses 6 through 10. Now, at Eastside, we usually stand in recognition that this is God's Word for us. The Bible is one unified story that points us to Jesus. So wherever you are, whatever you're doing, if you'd take the time right now to stand as I read these words. Ryan told me not to stand, so I'm going to sit. You stand. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap, and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Would you pray with me? God, as we read your word and as we study, would you help us to learn more about you and, and more about ourselves and how you want us to think about finances in our life. Lord, we pray this in the strong and powerful name, the character and quality of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We're going to jump right in and I want to look at a couple things from these verses uh, and we won't be here too long. But first, the goal for all of this for Paul is contentment. He's been teaching Timothy about what he should teach, what he, Timothy, should teach. And the verse right before this, in verse 5, he says people are using godliness as a means for financial gain. And now Paul contrasts financial gain with the gain that comes from contentment. And he says godliness with contentment is great gain. And it's actually the Greek word mega, like mega gain by being content. The way that we get to where we want to go in life is not by, not by striving for more, but by being content with what we have. Paul says that food and clothing is enough. We'll be content with that. And that's absolutely contrary to everything that we see and know in our culture. Food and clothing is enough. John the Baptist was preaching and telling the people, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. And they came to him and he said, they, they asked him, well then what should we do? And he said, if you have two coats, give one to someone who needs one. And then that gutted me because I began to think like simple thing like coats. I have a coat for when I'm working. I have a coat for when it's a little chilly outside. I have a coat for when it's a lot chilly outside. 
I have a coat for when it's like freeze your tail off cold outside. I have a coat that looks not like I have more coats than what I know what to do with. Paul said, if we have food and clothing, we will be content. Contentment is a foreign concept to us. Over the next 48 hours, whether it's Facebook or your phone or the little game that you play on your phone or television or Netflix, you're going to be bombarded with thousands and thousands of advertisements and messages. And every one of those is telling you not to be content. Don't be content with where you are. Don't be content with what you have. Don't be content with how your life is right now. Every one of those messages is telling you how not to be content. But Paul says, godliness with contentment is great gain. This is clearly about our desires. Paul, in the next verse, in verse 9, Paul says, those who want to get rich, and the word is to, to be fully resolved, to set your heart and mind on getting rich, leads to temptation and it's a trap, and it, it leads to desires that can plunge you into ruin and destruction. This is clearly about our desires. What's in your heart? What is causing you to do the things that you do? What is causing you to reach for the things that you reach for? And desires have outcomes. Desires have consequences. <clears throat> Most of us desire wealth, and I don't know that in and of itself that's bad, but we have to ask ourselves the question, why do I desire wealth? Why do I desire more? Why do I use money the way that I use it. You see, if you're like me, you probably think, I don't want to get rich. I would just like to be able to, maybe it's buy a new thing or maybe it's go to a new place. I don't want to be rich. I just want to. And that's exactly the opposite of contentment. We reach for things all the time. So why do you want to be rich? Is it security? Some of us think that if we have wealth that we will be able to keep ourselves out of some kind of danger, whether it's medical danger, physical danger, whether it's better protecting our house or our homes and all of those things. Some of us use wealth for status and I certainly wouldn't want other people to see me uh, a certain way. And then we go the opposite way. We're like, oh, I want people to think that I live simply so I'm going to buy some oatmeal from the top of a mountain in Antarctica that came from underneath a penguin's arm. Like we, we just go crazy because so we look like we're living a certain lifestyle. Some of us desire wealth for power or control. And maybe you're thinking, I don't need power, but control is the same as power. It's, it's uh, being able to manipulate the outcomes that we have because of our wealth. We all desire some of those things. <clears throat> or maybe you're like me as well and you think, I want to have some wealth so that I can be generous. Family, I'm here to tell you that if you're not generous in scarcity, you're not going to be generous in wealth. Wealth comes, or generosity comes from a heart that recognizes that we have a king who's generous, that we have a father who's generous, and our goal is to live generous lives because we have a father who is generous with us. The last verse that I want to look at here is verse 10, and it's got some really important clues for us in what we, what we do and how we live our life and how it relates to our finances. This is a, a famous verse. It gets quoted and ultimately it gets misquoted a lot. I've heard people say that money is the root of evil. That's not what it says. I've heard people say the love of money is the root of evil. That's not what it says. It says the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And so let's dig in a little bit. First, Paul says the love of money, and he uses the Greek word for love, philos. It's a, it's a relational love. It's a familial love like brotherly love. The city of Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love. Like It's a family kind of love. And so what I want you to know is that we can't use finances to replace what only relationship can give us, whether it's relationship we're reaching out to the people around us or reaching up to God. You can't satisfy with money that which was meant to be satisfied with relationship. This is so important. We reach for things to satisfy us with our wealth and with our money. And it's things that can only be satisfied with relationship. The second thing that I found really interesting about this verse is we've been talking about Genesis. And Pastor Peter told us a couple weeks ago that in Genesis we see people paralleled with trees. People 
can be like trees. They can produce good fruit or bad fruit. And people can produce good fruit or bad fruit. And here it says money is, the love of money is a root. It's something that's associated with tree. And it's a root that can lead to all kinds of evil. We saw in Genesis the tree of knowledge of good and evil. I think Paul is trying to remind us of those trees and that as people we can we can reach for money and produce bad fruit or we can be content and produce good fruit. And just to make the point even stronger, it, he says, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil and some people eager for money and the word in Greek is to reach or stretch. And so just as Adam and Eve reached and stretch for fruit that they saw that was beautiful and good for food. So we reach and stretch for things, thinking that it will give us something that only relationship can give us. <clears throat> so this is how I want to finish up Eastside. I think what Paul is saying is intended to remind us in creation. And in creation we see the story of Sabbath. Sabbath is this is this reminder of the people of God to take your time, one-seventh of your time, and give it to God. Remember that it's His. In Exodus and Deuteronomy, when Moses explains what, what Exodus is for, he tells the people it's for, so that you can rest from your work, and so your animals can rest from their work, and so your slaves can rest from their work. It's about our livelihood. It's about our, our, our earning a living. It's about wealth. And Sabbath is a time to set all that aside. Forget what you can accomplish with seven days and remember that time belongs to God. So too tithing is the same way. Tithing is simply an old English word that means tenth and people traditionally whether it's in the Old Testament or uh, we see it happening throughout all of Scripture uh, and then we see it happening within the people of God throughout history giving this tenth of our finances and we do that to remember. Number one, finances don't have a grip on me and I'm gonna remember that Everything that I have that is of value comes from God. I'm not going to let finances grip me and control me. I'm going to return to relationship to give me what I need when I'm tempted to reach and do it through finances. Both Sabbath and both, uh, both Sabbath and tithing communicate by the people of God that God gives us what we need. I'll be content in God and not keep reaching for finances and not keep reaching for things that I think will satisfy me that only God can give me. So to finish up, I have a couple questions. How does money function for you? Is it security? I think the last couple days should tell us all that nothing, uh, nothing makes us secure. Not your money, not my money. Things happen in our life and those things, security goes right out the window. Is it for pleasure? When I, when I come into some extra money, the first thing that I do is think about what I might be able to buy myself with some extra cash. Does money function as pleasure for you? Is it status? Do you want, to, uh, do you want your wealth to affect how others people see you? Or is it power or control? Like, I, I'm going to use my wealth to control my outcomes. My outcomes for me, my outcomes for my family, my outcomes for my children. I want them to be involved in this program or I want them to do this. We use wealth to try to control our lives and we can't do that. It doesn't work. Don't let money do what only relationship can do for you. And again, we're all evaluating our needs and wants. What do we really need and what do we want? And the last couple days have taught us all that uh, those things, we have to evaluate and ask ourselves tough questions. So, uh, the coronavirus and being isolated has made us all evaluate. Evaluate how money functions for you. And then lastly, what do you most want? What do you most want? What's the desire within your heart? What are the things that are gripping you? Is it a love for people and relationship? and fulfilling those things, love for God and your relationship with Him, or is it for something else? Take this time, leading up, to, leading up to Easter, we have this prayer guide. Take time, dig in, spend time listening to God, spend time developing that relationship up, and then spend time developing that relationship out. Look, we can't be very far, or very close to each other. Ryan and I are six feet apart here as we record this. 
go on walks, use Zoom, use Facebook or uh, Google Hangouts, use Facebook, stay in touch with people. I was walking down the street the other day and, and got to see my neighbor and we were asking each other, look, do you guys have what you need? Are you okay? Can we help? Spend time, reach out, reach up, spend time developing those relationships. I know it's tough. Eastside, be blessed. What do you need? What do you want? Don't reach for things that aren't going to fulfill you. Be reminded that God loves you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. We'll see you soon. As we close our time in worship today, we're going to sing a song that's probably familiar, but we're also going to sing the verse in Spanish as well. And Glorian's going to teach us how to say it. He decidido. He decidido. Seguir a Cristo. Seguir a Cristo. No vuelvo atrás. No vuelvo atrás. No vuelvo atrás. No vuelvo atrás. Do we do okay? Yeah. All right. Here we go.